Hello, everybody, and welcome to Dot to Dot. Today, we're going to talk about what the 90-foot stone reveals. Um, we're going to look at uh, basically the words that were basically transcribed or trans, uh, translated through the cipher of the 90-foot stone. We're going to look at the etymology of those. And then we're going to go on to possibly uh, looking at what happened during that time period and who may be uh, responsible or partly responsible for the uh, legend of Oak Island. So let's, uh, here's my presentation and we'll get started. So here's the 90 foot stone. And in my last video, I talked about how this is a cipher. This is a cipher and it is telling you a message in English. Now there may be a dual cipher and it may have a Spanish interpretation, which was put forth um, in the 1970s by Dr. Wilhelm. But uh, for right now, we're going to go with this English translation. And in this English translation, we have 40 feet below 2 million pounds or buried. Now, of course, without the 90-foot stone, we really don't have the legend of Oak Island. So we have to assume that this is not hoaxed that it was real and that it was put in the earth at the time by supposedly the people who hid whatever is on Oak Island. So what I did is I start with the word 40. And we look at the word 40, and this is from the Middle English Compendium. And what I did is I looked up all the words in this uh, translation, this message, and I find all these uh, different words or spellings for the word 40. But the word 40 was spelled here. It is a form that was utilized in the 1400s. So that is one of the dates, 1400. It cannot be any earlier than that as far as we know by history. And these are the earliest. I found the earliest ones. The next one is feet. And we have a form of feet. And look at all these forms. During Middle English, uh, all the way up to about uh, the late 15th century to the early 16th century, the English language was going through a big change, especially converting from a lot of the the German uh, kind of influences and the, and the Germanic uh, Anglo-Saxon influences. And there was a lot of changes in valves, vowels and stuff. So, but we have this one. This was a uh, used um, spelling during that time. And we have 1390. And here's an example. This is, these are quotes from publications of that time period. So we have that spelling. Now this is the one that really basically is very mysterious and sort of blows the doors off the 90 foot stone. And that's the word below. And there is no match. I could find no match. But I did find a reference uh, that beneath was the usual word that they used. And uh, it only, and it was very rare. So it's not to say that it wasn't used before the 16th century, but it was actually made popular by um, Shakespeare. And also during the uh, 16th century, uh, the um, putting together of dictionaries was also uh, something that was happening. And these are things that can be utilized to find the time period of a spelling of when a word was used. But uh, 1570 was the time of Shakespeare, and it could be as early as 1500s. So we're going to go to 1500. So that's the earliest, really, this message could be. It can't be any earlier. Then we have uh, the word two. We got 1425. Million is a French word, and it goes back to the late 13th century, so that's pretty old. Uh, pounds, now this is one thing that uh, 
we do I could not find a plural form of pound, but I do have pound. So I do not find pounds. So that's a questionable one there. Uh, then we have R, which was actually uh, sort of a word that came from Old English. It's also Scottish. And this is uh, the English used to use Ben and Art, you know, thou art. But R is a spelling that was used in 1475. And here's an example. Uh, the word buried is found also, and it actually is closely related to the Lowland Scots, and uh, this also says that, that the Scottish, by the, this time period, by the end of the 15th century, uh, their language was pretty much virtually indistinguish, uh, indistinguishable uh, from the North Umbrian Middle English, so the people of North England. That was, uh, this is found 1500. So this goes along with below. So this is uh, the earliest I could find for the word buried with this spelling. And so this is comes to the conclusion that the earliest that we can date the 90 foot stone according to the etymology of the words from the translation is 1500. And most likely, we can give it a 50-year time period, 1550. Of course, we can go all the way to modern time, but then we will be saying that it is a hoax. And if it's a hoax, then we have two other documents that would probably be hoaxes. But we're going to go with the assumption they're not hoaxes. And here's one thing I'm going to show you. This is the document that was put forth by Philip Stevenson on the, I think it was last season of the Curse of Oak Island, not uh, season nine, but season eight. And this is utilizing the same cipher as the nine foot stone. And however, this is a message in French. And it basically uh, simula uh, simulates the same numbers that came out of La Formula, which was the uh, document presented by Zener Halpern, which had the same symbols. However, you do note that on the Philip Stevenson, the M symbol is different. It has a line underneath here. So was there somebody using these symbols during this time period? Was this a standard symbol uh, cipher that was used in certain secret society or, well, we possibly a Templar or Knights Hospitaller or Order of Christ kind of uh, society. They were using this. And did uh, Deonston, uh, the uh, relative of Philip Stevenson, did uh, Deonston get this message from somebody else that was connected with those societies. But there's something different in this uh, cipher that was not in the formula, and that was the minus 21 degrees. And I think all the rest of these numbers, oh, the 145. So these were not, these were new data or new information that was not in the formula. But I'm going to focus here on the minus 21 degrees. So we go, this is a uh, graph that I did a while back. And it is an interpolation of what we call declination, uh, declination data, which is the difference between magnetic north and, and true north. And this was, this is from the NOAA. NOAA website, and it is with the latitude of Oak Island. And what I did, since the data only goes back to 1590, uh, what I did is I reversed the data going forward. So this is, was before going forward to our time, and I reversed it. And this is taking the assumption that 
possibly the Earth and its magnetic declination is like a sine wave. And that what is going forward was repeated in the past. So if this is true, or it's an accurate way of discovery, then basically 21 degrees, which was on Deonstan's, my, this is a declination because it's a, an adjustment to north, minus 21 degrees, uh, puts it right about 1520 to 1525 is roughly about where 21 degrees. And then we can go back, which is about 50, 1450. So those are the periods of time through this interpolation of when the 90 foot or when uh, the declination was minus 21 degrees. So what was happening during 1522? Well, one of the things about the order of Christ it was divided into two branches. Now, there's not a lot of evidence to support this, but there is a uh, what what goes forward in history, which is known, sort of shows that there may have been some kind of a schism within the order of Christ, or something found out in around 1525 or 1522 to 1523, because so, there was a new order that was established. Um, by Fra Antonio, and it also was basically the beginning of a reformation, a reformation of the order of Christ, and this is why, and it's very interesting, is uh, before, they're talking about the Rosicrucian Manifesto, which was in 1610, so this is 80 years before and it was around 1530, they had the expulsion of several friars from the order of Christ because they found an interior chamber, which was supposedly an initiation room. And the reason why they thought it was an initiation room because it, it had seven steps and seven car, carved roses and crosses. And these seven steps, they basically go back to John the Baptist, which are, which he belonged to the Essenes, and it is it's a sort of a uh, a doctrine that the Essenes had called the seven mirrors, and it's basically the reflection of seven uh, values within yourself. But the uh, they also found a circular sun on the vault. And we saw that sun, uh, that sun symbol on the church side in this season of Oak Island. And they also found another small tomb of initiation. So was this a hiding place for the relics or whatever treasure that went to Oak Island? Who knows? So it's interesting because Rosicrucianism, there's a lot of theories of Oak Island about Rosicrucianism and Francis Bacon and a lot of uh, that kind of genre. And this is sort of a telling thing. So anyway, the Reformation of the Order was uh, put forth and it basically uh, went to... Uh, to basically, uh, it says that they burned a lot of documents of the order uh, that were attributed to um, the, the order of Christ. Apparently, the people that were uh, involved in this, I don't think they were killed. I think uh, they were executed, but uh, it did say that they uh, killed four people. Now, new Christians, uh, there was one thing that was going on in Portugal at the time was the influx of Jewish uh, people. And they were basically what they called new Christians. And this happened during the Portuguese Inquisition. And this didn't happen until 1536. 
and it was delayed. It should have happened around 15, 15, um, but it didn't. And it didn't happen until about 1536. So these are the things that were happening during the early 1500s in Portugal and with the Order of Christ. Now, we're going to look into some of the English or some of the explorers during this time and look at the different people that actually made it to North America. And one of the first ones was John Cabot. And there's a lot of controversy surrounding his expedition. Um, a lot of people don't know if he made it back. He did make it back. Um, but there is documentation of his uh, journeys. And uh, he made several of them, actually. So the, I'm saying the latter one, he may have not made it back. But um, this is interesting. This is comes from a chronicle from the city of Bristow is where he left from. And the Chronicle entry states in full, this year on St. On Saint John's Baptist Day, June 24th, 1497, the land of America was found. And it's very interesting because in, and I'm going to show you a little bit later, in this map that was brought forth by Zena Halperin, the date on that map was June 24th doesn't say, state a year, really, but it says June 24th. So this is, you can read this and pause and read it. I'm not going to read it all, all these uh, information that I have for you because it'll just take too long. But uh, this is in Halifax. This is a plaque dedicated to John Cabot and honoring John Cabot. And... This is uh, talking about him uh, going to Nova Scotia and Labrador and Breton Islands. And so he, he made a lot of stops over in North America. But one of the things that I'm going to show you is uh, le uh, that this letter, the John Day letter, which documents this discovery, said it seems most likely the initial landfall was either on Newfoundland or near Cape Britain, which is Nova Scotia. Um, this is because days and letter applies that the coastline explored in 1797 lay between these latitudes. So what latitudes are we talking about? Well, we're talking about latitudes that were in this treaty that were made basically by the Spanish in uh, a treaty after Christopher Columbus went to uh, the Caribbean, and these are the two; these are the two lines of latitude right here. And if you noticed, it goes to basically it says the mouth of the Bordeaux River, but the treaty actually says it is Bordeaux, which is basically forty-five degrees. And this is another. Thing that is on the map that was I'm going to show you next that was on Zena Halpern's that was shown by Zena Halpern but this is uh, basically they're saying that he was south of this latitude line right here so we're going to go to here's the map and this in French right here says the 24th now, the first thing that comes to my mind is, well, it's in French, but he's English. So why would he put it in French? It's a good question, and I don't know the answer. But this is the, uh, this is the map, and basically right if you, this star would actually be the line that goes to Bordeaux. So this would be that parallel line. So what happened to John Cabot? Uh, well, this historian says that, she, that he did come back and he made another two-year expedition exploring the east coast of North America, south to the Chesapeake Bay, and as far south as to the Caribbean. So 
in 1500, okay, or just before 1500, there was an explorer that possibly had mapped out the north, the east coast of the United States, all the way down into the Caribbean. And she says that this is well known because of other information that was included in this Spanish cartographer. So well, I guess what I'm trying to get out of this is, is these guys that went out and explored, they shared their information. They shared it. So it wouldn't be too uh, unreasonable to think that, you know, some of these explorers uh, knew where all these explorers knew how to get there and where to go because of who went before them. So there was another explorer that came out. It's Sebastian Cabot. Now, I don't know if he was Mr. French that wrote the map, but uh, of course I joke and I'm revealing my age with Sebastian Cabot. So uh, this is uh, basically he went over there and uh, he did a expedition also in 1509. Another thing too is this chronicle reports that John Cabot went back or went in 1498 and he brought carrying merchandise of including cloth, caps, lace points, and other trifles. And remember we found that cloth seal. So there's just a, a very coincidental uh, connection there. So this is supposedly um, the, the route that was taken by Sebastian Cabot. And he went all the way up into the Hudson Bay and notice he goes right by Oak Island, right by Nova Scotia, and down to the Chesapeake Bay. Now, this also falls in line with uh, some of the other documents that were found by um, Bill Jackson and the documents uh, to uh, Hunter Mountain, which is all in here. So, one of the other uh, explorers was Miguel Corte Real, and uh, he was basically an explorer in 1500. Went to Newfoundland. The old the other the one thing about this is he never came back, so nobody knows where he is. And um, they there's a theory that he was responsible for carving the Dighton Rock, which is down in Taunton, Massachusetts. And it's one of those uh, unexplained uh, rock carvings that are down there. But it's there's been some scholars that have debunked that. But this is another guy in 1500 that went uh, exploring. And then we had in 1534, French uh, explorer Jacques Cartier, and he was basically the guy that set up the first um, settlement in Quebec. So it was uh, in after thir 1534, this is what uh, you try and get across on uh, 1534, between 1534 and 1603, when Port Royal in Nova Scotia was established, there was a lot of traffic. And most of it was for commerce. They were looking for gold and other precious things. And they were looking, uh, they were also uh, doing hunting for beaver, for furs. And we know that later on that whole area just explodes um, after, basically after the 1600s, it explodes with a lot of uh, trade and merchants coming to the new world. So, was Oak Island going to be that secret anymore? Well, I think prior to 1600, uh, it may have been still pretty safe to do something that would be kept secret. But so this is the uh, avenue of the 
French explorer Cartier. This is his first voyage. And notice his whole thing was trying to find a way to China. <laughs> he didn't realize there was a whole continent in front of him. But And then he goes down. He's the one that started uh, this down, going down the St. Lawrence River and discovering that. So this is a guy that actually... Um, uh, Doug Crawl had put forth theory about this guy. And this is very interesting. He came over in 1520. And there's actually a monument in Halifax. And notice the Templar crosses. And this uh, this guy is was sent by the King of France who which was the Grand Master of the Order of Christ. Because remember, the Order of Christ was no longer with the church. It was a royal um, subject at that point. And uh, Miguel I, who was the, uh, the Grand Master and King of Portugal, uh, he sent this guy over to supposedly start a fishing station for codfish. And... This guy explored all the different areas, and I'll show you a map, but uh, he went over and he made several expeditions to Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. And basically it takes about 60 days to go from one side round trip. One of the things that was happening during this time also was the Knights Hospitaller had just lost the uh, island of Rhodes to the Muslims, to the Ottoman Empire. Um, we also had the rise of humanism that was coming up. You had the excommunication of Martin Luther, so the Reformation was starting. King Manuel I died in uh, 1521. And I don't know who became the Grand Master after that. And the Portuguese Inquisition was delayed, but it started in 1536. And there was, in 1510, the mature colonization of the Azor Islands. So I'm taking into account all this information that is happening. And the Grand Master of the Knights Hospitaller was uh, Philip de Villers. Now, when we look at the amount of commanderies that were in Portugal at the time, and these are commanderies of the Knights Hospitaller, so you can see that they were very much integrated into Portugal. And it was the King um, Denis that basically told the Pope when he said to hand over all the Templar, um, the Templar uh, property to the church or to the Knights Hospitaller. And he said no, he kept it. So it makes me wonder how what was that relationship between all these commanderies of the Knights Hospitaller and the Order of Christ? And my opinion is they united and they had their own they had their own little separate commanderies, but they they worked together. Now I can't verify that. I believe that that's the most logical conclusion one can come to because uh, they're still there. They were still there. And this is proof of it. This is a, um, a monastery that's near the town of where that last guy, um, this guy, lived. So this guy lived near this town. I'm going to show you. So this is a monastery near there. And this is the outside of it. 
Now, this is one of the first documented military orders in the Portuguese territory. And it was to the Knights Hospitaller. So here's that monastery right here. Here's the church that was on, that they, Rick Lagina visited with um, in Portugal and the Fonte Ar Arcadia. And here is the town right here where uh, the, the guy, uh, what's his name? I don't know how to say that, but this guy, Yohail, was from. So that's the town that he was from. And so they're within, this is 20 mile radius of each other. And this is the fort that was built near that town that he was at. And this is the fort. And it was built around the 13th century, but it really got built up during Emmanuel I's reign in the 15th century. So this was a major uh, station for possibly the Order of Christ was a port. So this is the journey of Wyo, and he came across, and he went to the Funk Islands, the Penguin Islands, down through here, and he went to Halifax and the Sable Islands. So does that mean that he's the one that was responsible for Oak Island? Probably not. But what I'm trying to get here is there's a lot of activity happening in the 1500s and that this man, uh, where is it? This guy right here possibly was a person who was sent there to maybe find or shore up or start some kind of food supply for what was coming and that Manuel the first he dies so I don't I think if there was anything that was going on that was between the night the Christ of Knights of Christ and the Knights Hospitaller as one group that it probably would have been through Devillers or through his orders that it would go uh, to Oak Island. But this is definitely something that uh, is very speculative and it does nothing to really uh, bring forth the mystery of Oak Island. Only finding the treasure will bring forth the mystery of who did it and when. So that's all I have for you today. I appreciate you watching. Subscribe and like. I really appreciate that. And thank you very much. Have a good day.